in this episode, I've got something really special. I'm going to be talking about skateboarding with a friend of mine who is also another teacher named Artur. And he's from Brazil, and we met in various groups. And then I realized that he is also a skateboarder. And I just got back into skateboarding after many years, not to say how old I am. But it was a treat to see him tackling this as well as an adult. So I thought, you know what? We're both teachers. Let's talk about how skateboarding is related to language learning, to teaching, to being a student, to providing services. And you might not think of it at first, but there's a lot of parallels that we draw in here. So I hope you enjoy today's episode. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I'm here to help you master an American accent in English because your voice is your choice when it comes to how you sound. I try to release a podcast episode every two weeks. And so you should really subscribe to whatever podcast platform you use so that you don't miss the newest episode. And by the way, if you want to see the full video of the episode, it's available at Accent Coach Bianca on YouTube. Now, let's get on with the show. Dor, I have not seen you in a really long time. How have you been? Good. I'm doing great. Just teaching to care of Emily. I picked up on skateboarding again very recently. So I'm really excited about this. And I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're gonna, we're actually going to, that's our main theme today. We're going to talk about skateboarding and how it relates to language. Because I noticed you've been lately putting up some videos of skateboarding. And I thought, oh, that is awesome. Like, I, I took up skateboarding again after a while as well. And I was like, so good for you to do that and put yourself out there. Because it's physically scary. And also in terms of your social media, if you're a teacher, like, oh, I'm going to put this other thing out there. And how's that going to go down? So we wanted to talk about how that relates to learning a language, believe it or not, and also teaching, I think, too. So this is going to be super interesting, I think, for a lot of people. But first, let's tell people how we know each other. And yeah, let's catch up a little bit more, too. For anybody who doesn't know Arthur, he's on Instagram. He's a teacher of English living in Brazil. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that, where, where you're living right now, what that's like for people who don't know. Yeah. So people ask me, oh, are you currently based in Brazil? And I say, base, born and raised. Nice. So, base, born and raised in Brazil. I'm right in the middle of the country, really near the capital, so center west. Mm -hmm. And the state, the name of the state is Goiás. Mm -hmm. I'm here in the state of Goiás. And I've been here my whole life. And mm -hmm. I, I lived abroad a little bit, but came back. And tell us a little bit about that. Like, where did you live abroad and what is the English learning situation like? And how, how did that become your passion and now your career? Can you go into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. When I, firstly, I studied journalism, right? And when I was studying journalism at the age of 23, I decided to take up on that Erasmus Rhodes and moved to Coimbra. I moved to Portugal, to the city of Coimbra. And there I studied journalism, a little bit of sociology. And I stayed there for a year and it was great. I lived at the same house with us, with an Italian guy, with a Slovakian girl, a Polish guy. So English was pretty much uh, our uh, language of connection. Communication. You know? Oh, that's Did funny you because when you said you went to Portugal, I thought, oh, yeah, yeah. well, the Portuguese, but it's an international program, I bet, for journalism. Yeah, yeah you weren't really using... Portuguese so much yeah, as well. You were yeah. using English. Ah, and well, I know there, there are differences are between. One of yeah. my good friends from that time, he is French, and we still communicate using English. So that's when I realized, and of course we have the chance to travel around a little bit. That's when I realized how English can open doors for a larger community and international community. That has been fascinating me so mm. far since then. Oh, yeah. I was also quite young when I did like my first exchange too. And it made me realize that whatever the main language is of communication, isn't it great to speak multiple languages and to be able to connect Absolutely. with people that otherwise you just don't even know how many United States citizens just don't have a passport? The majority. And they don't usually learn many languages. So it's just literally, like you said, opens doors, opens the world up to people. And you get to chat with people maybe on a, a tourist level, maybe on a friend level, maybe through somebody else you meet through, I don't know, let's say a Discord server or something like that, and you have a shared interest, or maybe even professionally, like us. I remember you and I originally met because we were both in Hadar's teaching group, as far as I remember. And I think we connected way back then, and then we just kept up. Absolutely. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Night Nation. Well, right? you're now, right, I forgot about that. Thing. 
Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. We were also in another group together called Night Owl Nation, and that was to learn storytelling and things like that. And I think a lot of those groups have some overlap, too, because, again, it's about communication and True opening that. doors and connecting. We know, we know each other from two different places, actually, and I'm super two excited places. to talk to you today because once I saw you started making those skateboarding videos, I was like, huh? Here's something we can connect that people don't really think about. I know I started skateboarding when I was a kid. Maybe if I was when I first got my skateboard. And I remember that was the best Christmas ever. And wow. I had a bicycle and I had a skateboard. And we at the time, we lived on a road. It's called a, a rural route or rural route, if you want. And it was in the country. And it was this big, long road with a couple big hills. And that's how I learned to skateboard in my driveway. My brother and I... <laughs> Yeah, and then there was this traffic and really scary. So that's when I first learned to skateboard. And what about you? Were you also a kid when you learned? Yeah, I was a kid. Actually, I have some pictures of me at the age of two and three on a mm -hmm. skateboard. Yeah, oh, wow. two, three, and four. I, mm -hmm. I guess my cousins, they had their skateboards and, and I would ask them to hop on in because then mm -hmm. I have those pictures and I'm completely by myself. Wow. On that. Wow. I don't know what. This that you were saying reminds me of Rock and Mullet, this mm. big name on skateboarding. Mm -hmm. He said that skaters share a universal language because if I tell you, hey, I can pop it an Ollie, mm -hmm. that name connects us, it right? Does. And I can yes. I, and actually I can do, I don't know, a kickflip. And those names imagine organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. You have the movement and you have the name. So we share this. And so it, it connects it, but global community as well, just like a very specific language. Exactly. It's it's a jargon of some it's some shared interest, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And that so people outside of that community, it's not about language so much, uh, at least first language, like your, your normal communication language, but it's about a jargon that you can share with other people, even if they their level of regular language is higher, lower, whatever. You have lower, these terms, yeah. yeah. Or, mm. or even if they don't speak the language, but they see you writing and they, oh, she just did a quick flip. Same thing, uh -huh. maybe in Spanish. Yeah, but the main exactly. Quick flip but then that word, maybe. Totally, good point. Good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that earlier. For me, I was thinking about how skateboarding it connects to prior knowledge. For example, you started at maybe the age of two, let's say. You were just like, somebody plopped you on the board and you probably yeah. felt a little unstable because it rocks back and forth. And maybe you were a little scared because it pushes forward, but maybe you enjoyed the thrill, right? And you probably don't yeah. even remember this. But then but later then on, I, yeah, go ahead. But then I, my first memory, probably around 12, when I got my first skateboard. So those mm -hmm. memories are vivid for me. Mm, yeah, really. I, I remember the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like feeling unstable. Is that mm -hmm. the right movement here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Many reasons to be afraid of. Yeah. And this is when we're 12 years old. I don't know about you, but I was made of rubber. I, I could bounce off the floor when I was 12 years old. And so we had the fear. But now that we're older and we're both picking it back up again, yeah, fear, 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 fear is fear, way higher. Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe nowadays, I'm maybe in projecting the lights to the past, but yeah, <laughs> fear is around. You know, uh -huh. was, it, yeah, so. and and let's, so let's talk about fear with regard to language as well in a minute. But first, I want to get back into the story of our our skateboarding experiences. So what, I think you you must have taken a lesson when you were young, right? No, actually, when I was, I'm, I I took my first lesson recently, but when when I was twelve, thirteen. I had a couple of dreams that were for skateboarders, oh, right? right. And, and I had a few chances to ride, ride around with that. Okay. But just like you, I lived far away from the studio center, so I was pretty much by myself, uh -huh. trying to learn tricks and trying to figure out how to do stuff yeah. on the board. Right? Pre-internet, so, let's remind time. people. Pre-YouTube. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. We've had some famous magazines. Uh, and we're trying to remember them. Yeah, yeah, but some from magazines mm -hmm. with some pictures. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, imagine this is like language. Like we have books for language, but language is spoken. And so it's hard to relate yeah. some of those things sometimes. Like putting together, mm -hmm. I don't know, a, a dresser from Ikea. You have images, but still you have to figure everything out and you're questioning those things. So you took your first lesson much later. Let's, let's come back much to that later. in a second. Yeah. I would say... 
I was going to say something about when I was, you know, when I was young, I was really into, I think, also community, right? Maybe we lived far away from people, but then you meet other skaters and you're like, oh, yeah, like I'm immediately accepted in this group, right? Even for me, I'm a girl. Right. Even doesn't matter. It You are just you have your community, you have your people. I don't know if you felt that way when you were young, too. That's what I have been thinking about this. I think where I live, communities are more open now because I think mm-hmm. there was this kind of you're a poser. Here's there a was, vocabulary it, word for people. Not to yeah. oppose someone, but you're a poser, which is a person yeah. who poses or pretends to be something else. So for people, the mm-hmm. audience who might not know what that word is, because it comes from skateboarding culture, to be a poser is, yeah, go on. Tell us more about what that was like for you and what posers meant. Sure. So I had my friends and they were all, yeah, let's do it. And of course, everyone progresses at their own term, at their own time and speed. But I found that if you go to a skate park or other groups of skaters, there was this kind of rivalry, like maybe some sort of gang culture. Oh, really? And mm-hmm. graffiti mm-hmm. Yeah, associated mm-hmm. with skateboarding or something like that. So it, it were over black. So sometimes there was this kind of, of energy tied um, to it. So I I'm afraid see. I feel that it is more open and welcoming mm-hmm. and for kids. Mm-hmm. We had schools down back in the day. It wasn't that thing. Uh-huh. Oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that. Probably there's like a skateboarding kind of mentality community. But where you were, it was more related to, can I say it was negatively seen because of the the, the kind of gang aspect? It was seen as something negative, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. For us, it was more just called counterculture, let's say anti-establishment, right? For us, it was at least where I in my time, in my place, it was more about just not following the norms, right? Because the norm was you were a kid and you had a bike, right? No, if you had a skateboard, you had a different thing. I would say for us, there was graffiti. I would say there was, it was more about, I don't know, smoking pot or not. It was about relaxing and having a good time than it was about, let's say, crime or violence or something like that. At least where I grew up, that's what skateboard culture meant more. So I found that very interesting that you mentioned that. You wouldn't think of different subcultures. But for you now, it's more family-oriented, you might say. I think those different realities, they co And I don't know if I'm... Because what you described was a reality, too. This counterculture thing. Yeah. It was a reality as well. It, it, it was more like real skateboarders. So I was at a party once. I, I think I was around 12, 13. And... Uh, a friend of mine introduced me to this guy who was being celebrated for some mm-hmm. reason, and he had all the flashy clothes, trendy clothes, skateboarding, mm-hmm. clothes, you know? mm-hmm. and this friend of mine said, hey, he's a skateboarder too. And this guy looked me from hand to toe and said, he doesn't dread like, you know, so for the kind of- that's what I'm saying it's when I mentioned. When you are in the community or yeah. maybe there are some... Still a hierarchy, people. right? Yeah. There's still there's still a pecking order in some yes. way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, th- I feel like we just can't squeeze that out of humans, right? We always seem to right. find a way to put somebody else down so that we can be higher. And it's that's not how it works, right? It's not a zero-sum game. So, it, mm-hmm. it re- yeah, I can see what you mean, how that might be the case. And I, now that you say it, I do remember that sometimes popping up. And hopefully the people around would be like, Hey, man, that's not cool. Don't say stuff like that. Other people can keep them in check, but when they don't, that kind of thing just grows, right? That may, yeah. maybe it's even kind of prejudice in a way. Huh. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. And I guess yeah, that's also related to language. Yeah, yeah. In ter- yeah, in terms of language, there's, there's in-groups and out-groups and there's hierarchies and people are often, rather than being supportive, they're often biased or something like that. So they, they see that they size you up and they make assumptions and, and they, they, yeah, they, they add those things to what they think they already know of you too. Yeah. Another good point. Yeah, totally related. So let's fast forward a little bit, right? We skated a bit as kids. Life gets in the way, probably for you as well. You just you do other stuff. And then I remember the story starts for me probably 15 years ago, I would say. I don't know if I know. I don't know if I told you this. I don't know if you know this. I had a brain tumor and a pretty big one. And it was right directly on the hearing and balance nerve, right there on the, on the, by the ear. So they took it out 
but I'm always going to be deaf in this ear. And I only have one balance nerve now, right? So at the time when I was recovering, I thought, ooh, how can I kind of work on my balance? One thing I did was I joined this ship, a boat. And because the boat's always on the water, right? Whatever you do, you're just, you have to take that into account, but not consciously. So I tried to make my balance a little bit better than that. Fast forward a little bit. A couple of years ago, I went to visit a friend back in Philadelphia. I think I live in Mexico now. So I went back yeah. to this friend who's my age, a woman also. She didn't skateboard when she was a kid, but she just recently took it up at the age of, oh, I don't know, maybe 40, let's say. And I thought, you know what? I would like to do that again, too. So when I came back to Mexico, she was my inspiration. I came back to Mexico, bought a new board, bought like some, some elbow pads and a helmet and stuff. And I thought, oh, I want to do this. But I had another problem. I don't know if you know this as well. I got hit by a car, not on a skateboard. But a few years ago, I got hit by a car on my bike. And I had to have two knee surgeries, right? One, and then the next year I had another one. So my knee is not great. And here's where the fear comes in, because I am just terrified that I'm just going to land on it wrong. And I'm just going to twist that ACL again, or I'm going to hit the cartilage. And it's just because cartilage doesn't grow back very well. I'm, I now I have more fear as an adult, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try. So I have the balance issue, have the knee problem, but it's still something that I really want to get back into. So when I saw you doing it again, I got inspired by you and motivated by you as well. So tell us your story then of how to just pick it back up and what was that like? Wow. Uh, I'm just digesting everything. You it's said, right? Sorry, it's a lot. Right in. You know, it's a lot. I, I cannot even begin to imagine how the free to digest everything as well, too. Mm -hmm. And what can I do and cover. Mm -hmm. I hope you're recovering. Oh, yeah, definitely feeling better, I think, now. And so it is something that still motivates me because I feel like, oh, I still, I'm not skateboarding as much as I want to. Maybe I'm having a bad day in terms of my health or whatever, but it's always there as like a, an option and something I'm working towards, you know, you're little by little. Yeah, so, yeah, it's just, it's something that, that I keep in mind and it's a goal, let's say. It's a really good goal. Yeah. And that's me. But what motivated you then to pick it back up so suddenly? I think I never stopped watching people skateboarding. Mm -hmm. I like watching those clips. Mm -hmm. And I admire some skateboarders like Robin Mullen at the book. And mm -hmm. I, I'm reading his book. So from time to time, I just feel like we're skateboarding again. It happened mm -hmm. when my daughter was about to, to board. When I took up on skateboarding again for a while, but then I thought I shouldn't do this because if I get hurt, my daughter will be bored soon. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be in this condition, so better okay. change. Postpone it a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. So recently, I was watching those videos, and I thought it would be so nice to start skateboarding. Because <laughs> as teachers, sometimes we spend most of our time sitting down and, and teaching, and you know, yeah, a very <laughs> sedentary life. Right? Yeah. Skateboarding demands a lot on the body, but I was, you know, second guessing myself. So okay. I thought, you know what? I'm too old. Should I do it? And mm -hmm. then I started this thing out of the people. I saw the swimmer at the age of fit picking up on skateboarding again. No, starting to skateboard. For the first time. For the first wow. time. And wow. I saw that and she was ripping it. And I thought, you know what? I got to do this. I got to no do excuse. this. Yeah. No excuse. And I started finding people like starting at the age of 60 or yeah, on skateboarding again at the age of 60. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, what is it that I truly want? One. Mm -hmm. Do I want to have fun? Do I, do I want to take it at my own pace? Yeah. Or do I want to, you know, try to skateboard as I did it at the age of 13? So like, what you are my have goals? To, to, yeah. Yeah. What are my real goals here? So I had this mental shift process going on. Yeah. Let me admit, I even use chat the PT. Awesome. I, I mean, it. And, 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 and I said, awesome. hey, that's my reality. That's my age. Here's what I'm going to do. Am I too old for this? The uh -huh. airport chat DPT said, you're absolutely not too on Even the machine thinks that. Yeah. And extra careful now. Yeah. Yeah. Helmet and okay. you have to buy some pads. And I think maturity got me that. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise I would, no, no protection needed. Like you steer. So mm -hmm. I think that. The fact that I'm considering stretching, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. strength, hydrating, hydrating, yeah, yeah. strengthen mm -hmm. treatments to strengthen mm -hmm. my ties, my core, yeah, maybe your all core. that. So I'm much more aware of my body. And let me tell you something. I fell, and the next day, 
I had picked up on skateboarding again. My body was fine. And I thought, okay, I'm not as fragile as I thought I was. Oh, you know, no, so this super limit, yeah. I had this such big image of me being frail. Right. I'll break down. <laughs> we'll have mm-hmm. it. And then my body could be raw. Oh. So test, yeah. test the limits. Oh. Test the limits. And, oh. and your fear was greater than the reality, actually. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I've traveled oh. multiple times. I had one bid, but I traveled multiple times and nothing happened. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Definitely. What is this kind of fear? What is this kind of narrative that I'm putting inside my mind saying mm-hmm. that I can't or that I will smash yeah. on the ground? Or... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can't ignore it, too. We have to Absolutely. thank you to the fear. Thank you, fear, for trying to keep me safe. Yes. Now go away. <laughs> thank you so much, fear, for making me remember that I, because I, couldn't, I shouldn't be too overconfident. Like you said, I shouldn't be like, oh, I'm going to do all these tricks suddenly. And then what might happen? That could end very badly. So thank you, Fear, for keeping me in check a little bit, maybe keeping my ego in check. But also Which go away, good. Fear, because it's not as bad as you're making it out to be. So maybe it's similar to, to language, right? Look at people yeah. who start learning language at, a, at a, an older mm-hmm. age and they say, oh, I'm too old for that. Or they say, oh, I used to speak this other language and I'm too busy. The other thing about being an adult is we have to really be intentional about our choices, right? When, when I was a kid, I had all the time in the world, I felt. And so I would just, I would maybe skate a little bit because I was bored more than anything else. When I didn't understand how to use my time or that I could even. But now as an adult, you've got to really fit this in, right? You've got to plan for it. And it's something that you really want to do rather than just, it's a thing that I'm doing just because that's how I see it when you describe that. So yeah. recently I did my first skateboarding class. And when I got there, there was, there were these 12 year old kids, absolutely freaking monsters on paper <laughs> in a class. Oh, where? Oh, it was going to kill me. Yeah. What am I, I doing here? Mm-hmm. Look at those the kids. And I think that when it's regarding language, it's the okay. same. Oh, mm-hmm. my kid already speaks better than I do. Mm. I'll never learn that. Yeah. But but at the same time, as grown-ups, we have, a, we have other skits. Right? Yeah. Wait, mm-hmm. Regarding, for instance, how we can organize ourselves, how intentional we are. Yeah. It, or how we example, analyze what we're doing. How we analyze. When being mm-hmm. simply about, for example, how can we assess danger? As mm-hmm. adults, we say, hey, I cannot already right here because yeah. there is this metal bar here if i fall and i, I like my teeth i don't want to i don't want to like knock okay. yeah exactly i don't want to fall on it a kid doesn't think about it Mm-mm. Uh-huh. so long-term consequences so, yeah or mm-hmm. as a kid we tend to overestimate our abilities oh exactly yeah or maybe we're busy then, trying to impress friends as well uh-huh. yeah as an adult maybe we can assess our abilities better and maybe we tend to, if you are overconfident, but it, as an adult, we tend not to trust ourselves much. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. maybe the, the downside of it. Yeah. But we do have more life experience that will help us throughout the way to exactly. learn. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And I feel like the anal- the analytical part of our brain and our communication, even just with ourselves. Let's say you're um, a 12-year-old skateboarder and you're trying to describe how to do a trick to somebody, right? You don't know the names of the anatomy. You don't know how to describe which part to turn and in what way. And it's and you're just like, no, do like me. No, copy me. No, you're doing it wrong. Do it again. And it's, it seems, looking back, it's almost a waste of time, all the trial and error, when we as an adult, we can say, oh, rotate this. Use your toes to push down, right? Oh, use your heel to do this. And you are much more able to describe it to yourself and problem solve and also maybe communicate to other people in that way. That's something I've noticed as an adult Absolutely. doing these things. You know? It makes a lot of sense. Uh-huh. And maybe that's like language too, because we as teachers and as adults working on language, like I'm working on my Spanish right now, I have many more questions than I have answers because my analytical part is overthinking things too. For example, just the other day, I was trying to introduce somebody or somebody got introduced and we said, okay, so it was a male. And usually the male adjective ends with an O and the female one ends with an A. But when, when you say my partner, whether it's male or female, you end it with an A. And just 
for the first time that came up in my mind. And I thought, but why is that? Because I'm introducing a male. So I should say I should end it with an O. And I wouldn't have thought of that when I was young or if I had learned the language when I was young, I would have just soaked it up and maybe not even known how to describe that's it. That's how it is. You know? Yeah, that's just how it is. So a lot of people think there's, they believe this myth of, oh, when you're a kid, it's so much easier to learn language. It's that they have more time. It's that they just pick things up and don't really question them. That's their job as kids is to do things. And we as an adult, like we said, we have to be more intentional about it, right? We have to think about these things, but we have better tools, in fact to learn things like language as well. We can think about the grammar. We can think about which vocabulary do I use at work versus out on a date or something like that. So I'm already seeing a lot of parallels between skateboarding and just language in general. What are some of the things that that you noticed as well? I think my intent will go on that direction too. I was right to see how to ollie again by myself. And I was recording it because I I wanted to analyze it. And I would watch yeah. some, some tutorials, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I was trying to figure out, I was asked for some help. Some people gave me some tips here and there. But then yeah. I went to my first class. Okay. And this the teacher, he said, hey, your body is doing this. Check mm-hmm. the fan. Mm-hmm. And he went to, to the video again. Look. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, you're going to align your head mm-hmm. with your left. I'm a regnor, right? So yeah. my, my right foot is on the front. So mm-hmm. you're going to align your heart with your left knee. Oh, with your knee. Part the alignment. And yeah. when you jump, go forward. Don't go back because if, you're, if you go back. So he was giving me all the, these instructions, carefully tailoring my body with mm-hmm. a, almost as a, with a chisel. Like a chisel, yeah. Like chisel. sculpting in a way. Yeah. Sculpting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sculpting me. Sculpting every mo- movement I was doing. And then they landed it in such a good way. Oh, you had a great yeah. teacher then because it's, it's also like language, I feel like, too. When you have a good teacher who can say, hey, you think this is the problem, but this little thing right here, yeah. this try is this, the right that. Yeah, just al- align this and, align and it this. fixes everything. Yeah. And I've had good, let's say, good instructors and bad instructors in the past. And you uh-huh. can see the lucky. difference. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you got a good coach there, I would I say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. And at that's the end slick. of the day, at the end of the day, it's my Ollie. Yeah. And it's my progression. Mm-hmm. Same with language. Yeah. Because if you have a good coach, if you have a good tutor, yeah, the person will help you. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's you. It's your uh-huh. process. Uh-huh. uh-huh. It's your uh-huh. process. Uh-huh. And you can analyze your evolution, your progress over time. Right? Yeah. And you shouldn't compare, you shouldn't compare yourself I shouldn't prepare my Ollie. Different skateboard, different body, different way, different side, different everything. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I know it's an Ollie. He knows it's an Ollie. So I yeah. say, hello, you say hello. We're both saying hello. <laughs> We're going to notice differences. We can improve the way we say hello. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're communicating mm-hmm. and we are going to meet. And yes. Yeah. So and- I guess the coach, what the coach is doing is helping us. Get achieve the goal we want. Consider, considering the reality and the resources for each person. Have. Yes, each exactly. Person. You and I were talking before we started recording about how, like, the difference in teaching groups and individuals. And we were both talking about individuals and, and oh, yeah, we we're both really working with individuals. And part of it for me is figuring out just what that person needs, just their style, mm-hmm. how I know they're going to remember it. Because like, maybe like the skateboarding coach, right? I don't want you to depend on me forever. I don't want you to be stuck with me. I want you to make your own progress. I want to give you the tools to be able to figure out what you're doing wrong later and mm-hmm. fix it yourself. And yeah. always remember me, uh, but also go, little bird, fly from the yeah. nest. And go when you get the room. yeah, when you get a good match between a tutor or a teacher and and whatever skill you're learning, when the, when they can make that connection, that I feel like that's a good match and that's a good tutor for you. It doesn't mean those other teachers and tutors and instructors, they're not good, but they don't work for me. And I think that's another thing that I'm finding too, is that at least here, so far, I haven't found a skateboard instructor that that can speak to me in the way that that gets through to me. And I know that's because of my learning style. Maybe I'm over analytic because I'm also a teacher and we make the worst students, let's be honest. It's, I gotta, I gotta find, I gotta find somebody or I gotta figure out how to teach myself as well. So I think as adults, it's so much different. And I love seeing the parallels between these two. Is there anything else that you've noticed 
in terms of skateboarding at the intersection of language or teaching, perhaps, or learning as well? Is there anything else that you've noticed along the way? It's hard to be a beginner. It's hard to be a beginner because yeah. we want to progress. Maybe we want to progress faster than we are capable of. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's one point. Wait. Another thing is it takes time. Even if you implement get the, one of the most basic tricks, which is Ollie, you could have pop, slide, jump, land, but it takes time. Coordinate. Time and tiny. Mm -hmm. Right? Take time and tiny. Mm -hmm. You do that. And Repetition and muscle and memory. Repetition and exactly, muscle yeah. memory. Yeah. And the more you do it, the more you do it, it's going to get. Yes. And mm -hmm. especially regarding enunciation, right? It, I yeah. can see lots of hair policy. Like when you were just saying the, let's say the, I don't know what the number is, but if we broke it down, we said there are five parts to an ollie. And you said it's the this and the pop and the takeoff and the and how you shift your weight. And we can break it down right. into teeny tiny things and each one of yeah. those things hopefully, is a transferable skill. Movements. And so you could, in theory, practice each one of those things. I could just practice the pop and do it a thousand times. I could just practice the slide and do it a thousand times. And then yeah, my right. other Thank tricks, you. exactly. Mm -hmm. And then my other tricks are going to get better too because of that. And I think it's the same with A, language, and B, pronunciation, like we said before, right? Because, I don't know, let's pick a sound. Let's say the ah and cat sound. When I just get my muscle memory and my training and that I can just, I'm just always doing an ah, like every time, whether I'm sleepy, whether I haven't thought, whether I'm, I've got a heavy cognitive load, my ah is always coming out perfectly. Awesome. Don't even need to think about it. But then you might start to notice that, oh, this ah sounds a little bit different from this ah. And then we might point out, oh, you know why? You know why? That's because that ah is just in front of a nasal, right? An N or an M or an NG. And now that you're good enough, now you can hear the variations, right? Yeah. Now, oh, you, same, I feel like same with skateboarding, right? Now, oh, now you've perfected all these things. They feel second nature to you. There's still more. Mm -hmm. There's more you can notice. There's more yeah. you can do. You can shift the trick a little bit. You can, I don't know, yeah. grab something with your left hand instead of your right hand. You can grab it in the middle of the board versus the bottom of the board. Yeah, I feel like yeah. there's variation. With, with mastery, comes the uh, opportunity for variation. You know what I mean? That's what I'm, that's what I'm noticing too, yeah. Even though it's very physical, <laughs> skateboarding, and it's very, it's much more mental, a little bit physical, but much more like mental cognitive load than skateboarding. I think languages, it, there's a lot of parallels there too, I feel. Yeah. So, so many. But what about maybe teaching? Have you noticed any parallels between, let's say skateboarding and teaching? Because you mentioned a moment ago, it's hard to be a beginner, for example. Maybe talking about that a little bit on both sides, teaching and learning. Yeah, I, I haven't had the chance to, uh, to teach skateboarding, right? Yeah, I had my yeah. first class. So I mm -hmm. realized how much is important to have a dedicated coach, someone that is there for you and is truly listening to you, seeing mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. right? And I guess mm -hmm. that when we, were, we are teachers and tutors and we respect that person and we respect their tiny, their mm -hmm. classes, Mm -hmm. And and maybe, for example, how can we tailor the class to that person's level, right? Level of experience. Yeah. You cannot overload the class. Well, keeping that it, balance. You want to challenge, balance. but you don't want to overwhelm somebody. You don't somebody. want to discourage them in any way. But exactly. you don't want... Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. want them to feel like they've got these things, but also you want to push them a little bit. It's a difficult balance sometimes. And different people want different things. I have one guy where he will say, I can only handle so much. And so I have to hold myself back a little bit because he is from a culture where most of the people, they want as much as possible, right? They want to be corrected constantly. And But him, I know, ooh, I got to hold back. I know this is like where he's from, but he, we have specifically talked about this. So for me, I feel like I'm holding back. Whereas for other people, if I hold back, that's not good for them, right? They want as much as possible. And then maybe they'll review it later or whatever like that. So I feel, yeah, in terms of teaching, you so you never taught skateboarding, but right. you've taught English, obviously. So is there anything that you see from skateboarding that you've then taken and said, you know what, I'm going to keep this in mind when I'm teaching English? It made me realize one thing, going back to the mo one of the most basic tricks, right? Huh? It's, an it's an ollie. It's basic for the teacher, but for the student, it's something huge, right? And 
What I realized, and I felt so much gratitude because when you have someone helping you through the steps mm -hmm. and you feel, oh, now I, now I can do it. So I valued so much that day and that teacher that helped me, right? So yeah. when we are teaching, sometimes we think, is that enough? Is that too basic? Mm -hmm. Am I offering what this person needs? Mm -hmm. Wait, but for the, for the person that is starting and you're there following their journey and celebrating with them and they're feeling that I'm learning this yeah, and it's yeah. so great, right? Imagine, okay, I'm going to teach frontal vowels. Isn't that too basic? But for the mm. person that is 30, it isn't. And yeah. you're laying the foundation that will create the mm -hmm. future experience of that person learning the rest. We, we might forget that. We might forget how easy, how we take it for granted. Let's say that. We take it for granted exactly. what people need, what they know, what they want. Yeah. And that makes me think like maybe the number one thing between a skateboard instructor and the student or between a language learner and their coach is communication, yeah, especially as adults, right? We can say, no, hold on. This is too fast for me. Or I can say, oh, that thing that you mentioned, I'm still not quite getting it. Can we review that? And mm -hmm. having the let's say vulnerability to communicate about what we need. I feel like it makes the experience better for anybody in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you had a skateboard instructor who said, Hey, align your thing. I can see what's wrong. Align your thing. But yes. sometimes people need to be asked or people want to be asked and they don't know it, or there are cultural differences in how you approach oh, yes. teaching. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, I feel so like too. that's, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking about communication now too. Communication mm -hmm. style. Oh. Then. I don't operate yeah. this kind of feedback. Exactly. And also dealing with fear because okay. confidence and fear as two sides of the same coin. I had an experience with that teacher and he told me, jump this. And I was trying to jump. I had skills to do it, but I was missing the timing. Yeah. And I told him, I think I'm afraid. Mm. That's why I'm missing the timing. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid. And he told me, what is the worst thing that could happen to you? Mm -hmm. Because have you fell down while trying to jump? Yeah. Not one. If you do fall, this is the kind of fall you're going to have. So you fall, you're going to use your hands, you're going to roll, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So what are you afraid of? And I thought, okay. So yeah. Yeah. for example, avoiders, yeah. speakers who are avoiders, what is the fear? So you tackle that. And yes. you talk to them about that fear. Mm -hmm. What are you afraid of? Rejection. Afraid of getting laughed at? Yeah, rejection. Exactly. Maybe mm -hmm. someone will be racist or you know, yeah. public. What yeah. is the reality? So how can we handle fear, expectations? I yeah. think that is so crucial. Yeah. And fear versus reality. Like we said before, oh my God, fear I was so afraid of reality. falling down. And once I did, it wasn't actually that big of a deal. And I learned where my limit was. I learned how to, where to push myself. I learned what probably caused the problem so I can avoid it again. And I learned that it's not the worst thing in the world. I can get up and I can try again. So I feel like, yeah, I feel yeah. like fear holds people back a lot. M mostly maybe a fear of what you said, a fear of acceptance, a fear of somebody being racist, perhaps, or something like that. And those feel fears are definitely real. Sorry. Those fears are, let me say that again. Those fears are definitely real. But also, we can't let them hold us back either. And like you said, confidence. And confidence is usually the result of going through something difficult and making it through. So mm -hmm. people say, oh, I want confidence in speaking this language. But it's not going to come without any cost at all. you got to make mistakes. you got to put yourself out there. So I feel like there's so many parallels that we're drawing here between skateboarding and language <laughs> that we wouldn't even sure. thought about. I don't know if you thought about it originally or it just happened. No. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. I, I think you've touched something that is so deep and maybe I am not addressing it properly when you talk mm -hmm. about racism or xenophobia or something mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. right? And because they do happen and I haven't been through that in, in a way that it that was so intense. I, I've been mm -hmm. through that yeah. living abroad, right? But mm -hmm. I didn't know what it is to live what it is to live that on a regular basis. So maybe yeah. I'm overseas with flying it, but mm -hmm. I choose that one thing. We will always find our community. We will oh. always find people that will nurture us and be accepting us and, and, and yeah. exactly. supportive. Yeah. Support, yeah. Uh -huh. So maybe that's the importance of communities, right? When you join a community that is supported, 
and you feel that people get your back you know, mm-hmm. they're there for you mm-hmm. and you will find people there will always be someone yeah to support yeah. you along the way oh. so the fear versus reality so reality is not one-sided right yeah. another thing that i thought was for instance different teachers different teacher styles teaching mm-hmm. styles so i have a student but for me it's okay you know what check out the answer let's mm-hmm. see how we can best this oh no let's let's check christine dunbar let's yeah check yeah. hadar and because i know they're not perfect or i know that i have my own limits that and we can navigate this community you know pulling it pulling it back yeah to like looking at it from like a macro level of all the other te- that are out there too yeah we do the same thing and i think that's one reason that you and i get along really well too is we've already been in two communities together and we know the value of that and we're all slightly different and we all co- support each other. I feel like there's a lot of people out there who just want to go alone and do their own thing and that's cool. But it's so much, in my experience, so much richer when you can have a supportive community. And one thing I learned, too, when we were talking about skateboarding and support and racism and things like that, is I've often found, surprisingly, the community or the support very much in people who don't look like me, who aren't like me. So a lot of people look for community in kind of a reflection of themselves in a way. But I would challenge people to think outside the box and go to places where you might not originally think you would connect with somebody because you might be surprised that then you're widening your support system in ways that you wouldn't have thought of, you know, originally. Because I've had a lot of luck with that too. And I find that some, maybe sometimes even more racism comes within the group, like what you mentioned earlier, right? You were inside the skateboarding group and that's actually where you experienced even more kind of conflict. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. think, but yeah, yeah, sometimes that happened. But that occurred to me when you were talking about that just now. Yeah. Now, let, let me ask you one thing. I know you have been teaching for, for, for a long time. You have lots of experience, right? So when you think about Starting something new. How is that for you? Like trying new stuff, for instance, for example, uh, on Discord. I know that okay. you, you're there and mm. you're doing so much. So you're always pushing yourself forward, trying new things and so on and so forth. And I guess Deep Party is also that. What is the next trip? Right. Oh my God. Oh my God. You're so right about that. Yes. Yes. You want to do something new, right? You want that novelty. And then you get a little bit comfortable and you're saying, okay, what's next? You know, okay, what's next? Yes. And it's never easier, but it's easier to face the next challenge because you just yeah. did a challenge and you did it. So mm-hmm. you have this confidence that's going to keep pushing you through. Yeah. I just started recently my YouTube channel and that is huge. That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. And it, there's a lot of fear involved in that too. A lot of things I didn't even expect that I've had to deal with. And, and nobody sees that on the other end, right? You just see a video that somebody posts. There's a lot of work that goes into that. And it's the same with skateboarding. And I guess the fear is, the fear of failure is, it's not physical, right? If I fail at YouTube, I'm not going to, it's not like a broken arm. I'm going to be, physically I'll be fine. But there's almost the same amount of fear there. And so it's, it stops you. And it's good, like we said, listen to the fear, but also recognize what's real and what's not. So I think that's something new recently that I've started, that it was gave me more fear, but also I feel like, okay, I'm doing this now. And I'm at the point where I'm thinking, okay, now what? What's next? What's next for me? So that's a really great question that you asked for me. And I I wanted to ask you a question too, since we've been talking a lot about just skateboarding, but also learning languages, finding the right teacher, stuff like that. You're teaching as well right now. You also have a Discord. We, I think we started that too. and, And you started that. That's where you're meeting students. That was a learning curve that you had to overcome. And now I think you're the same way. You're comfortable with that. You're thinking, what's next? So for people who do connect with you and people who like your style and think that they might benefit from working with you, do you have have any other spots available right now? What's your teaching schedule like? Can you tell us a little bit more about opportunities that people would have to to contact you directly? Sure. I do have some spots available, yeah. I work in different time zones. For instance, I have students in Europe. Mm -hmm. I had a student in the U.S., Right. So my, my time zone overlaps with both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We um, kind of have to. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Instagram as, as well. So it's Arthur, A-R-T-U-R yep. dot C-L-I-C-I-O uh-huh. dot Costa, E-O-S-E-A. 
There we go. You can find me there. So people can find you then on Instagram and you've got a couple of spots open. Like we said, it, it, if, if I'm not the person for you, no problem. And you know what? Maybe I know somebody now that we sometimes I'll do an assessment with somebody and I'll say, you know what? I think you might fit better with this other person here. So, yeah, there's no you don't lose anything by trying and finding out who's who can really help you. Because I know you mentioned a lesson earlier about snow, um, skateboarding. Sorry. I keep saying snowboarding because I used to teach snowboarding, actually, when oh, I was an adult. So those things are overlapping in my mind a little bit. Okay. Very similar movements and similar kind of subculture and things like that. So. I Do keep that. saying snowboarding. That's why. But what I was going to say is, yeah, if you have somebody just, how should I put this? Just meeting somebody or watching their videos or looking at their Instagram feed gives you a pretty good idea of if you're going to get along with that person. And some people know right away and some people want to have a call and there's no loss of that time, I feel like, because you're, you're getting to know somebody and you're making a connection and through them, you're going to find somebody, you know, that might be better for you because that's in the end, that's what we all want. To make sure that we can connect the people with other people, whether that's me yeah. or not. So, yeah, I like, feel like that's awesome. I like to say that, like, as long as the work we're doing is helping you grow, it's <laughs> reason for us to work together. Mm, mm -hmm. But I think that what we truly want is growth, right? Yeah. So if it's not with me, I'll be glad to help you find someone who will offer you what you want. Need. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And your needs right. change over time too. So we, we recognize that as well. And uh, what was I going to say? There was something else you mentioned a minute ago about that. Oh, I lost it. I can't remember. But no, hold on. It's a really good point and it's at the tip of my tongue. Oh, I, can't, I can't remember. So can we have one of my challenges? Maybe? Please. Yeah, yeah. Do you have to remember. Mm -hmm. But for instance, I've been trying to expand my connection with people all over word wise mm -hmm. just like i said i have some students in europe yeah i'd like to have more students in europe i'd like mm -hmm. to have more students outside brazil mm -hmm. that's the idea right and how can i do that so this is one one thing that that i've been thinking about and another challenge is okay i'm a non-native english speaker and i'm a learner and a teacher at the same yeah. time and i try to learn things and point people towards what I consider the right direction and help mm -hmm. them communicate with clarity, confidence, all that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, that's the thing of being a teacher and a learner at the same time. For some time, I, I was embarrassed and I thought, who am I to, to do it? Who am I to Am I good enough to do it? You know? Yeah. But then I started feeling more comfortable with this idea that I'm a teacher, but I'm also a learner who teaches. And I'm aware of my limits, some of them, and I feel comfortable pointing other people that I know yeah. that will help with the process. So these are some of the challenges that I'm dealing with. Some of them, I, I think I overcame them already. I oh. have over, overcome them already. But yeah, this is what I was. Oh, about. that's but, awesome. Like what you said earlier. Oh, let's look at what this other person is doing. Let's see their style, right? Maybe I don't know the answer, but somebody else does. You know, mm. and what, what you meant too, or what I think you were saying about teaching and learning, right, is sometimes it gives us an imposter syndrome. And this probably comes back from the whole idea of being a poser, right, and somebody else's judgment on you. But it's good to have a little bit of that, I think, in the end, because if you don't, you're not maybe smart enough to know that's actually the, possibly the case. So people have a huge fear of imposter syndrome. But once you realize, hey, wait, I've got this imposter syndrome, then you can do something about it in that way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, that I wanted to end with too, is that I was, like I was saying earlier, I was a snowboard instructor also. And so I never taught, sorry, I never taught skateboarding, but I taught snowboarding. And one thing I noticed was that when people, let's say were snowboarding for a while and then they got comfortable, but they weren't pushing themselves anymore, taking a lesson, especially a one-on-one -on -one lesson with somebody, you're at this plateau, maybe in your language, maybe in your snowboarding, maybe in your skateboarding, right? You're comfy, and, but you don't push yourself. And maybe you don't even know how, right? Or you've been doing yeah. making the same mistakes for so long, you don't even see them. You don't even know their mistakes, right? That's where I think a coach can really help you out. And it's really worth okay. that, that money because it's not the cheapest way to go. But getting a one-on-one -on -one lesson with somebody who knows you 
means you can fix all of those things and you can get off that kind of plateau and, and start the next level. That's how I see it as well, which I actually noticed when people would take a snowboarding lesson, they'd feel renewed, they'd feel motivated again, and they would just get so much better after that. So if you feel stuck, yeah, if you feel stuck, like it's an investment is to meet with somebody so that they can look at you from the outside and say, here's what I notice and try to help you fix those things. Like you said, you can fix some of them yourself, but you may not even be aware of some of the other ones. Yeah. Uh-huh. And when you see the difference, you, you think, oh my God. <laughs> why didn't I do that like, sooner? Why didn't do that? Yes. Why didn't we wait so long? Exactly. So keeping all that in mind, just to quickly summarize everything, today we've been talking about how surprisingly skateboarding and a little bit of snowboarding can be related to language learning, language teaching, being a student, and all things like fear and confidence and all those things that you might not have originally thought of when I know you, Arthur, were thinking like, oh, I'm going to make a skateboarding video. Oh, I'm going to video myself. Oh, now I'm going to put it on my Instagram, right? Probably not what you were thinking at the time. But then once I saw you, I thought, oh my God, we have to talk about this for more people because here's this shared passion that we have of both getting back into skateboarding like as an adult. And so I'm, I want to thank you so much for coming today to talk about it because I had a lot of fun. I think it's actually going to be really helpful for a lot of people to hear this. I think so too. And thank you for having me. I had a blast. So. Yeah. I don't, it means we are already succeeding. For example, yeah, exactly. You come on the podcast and you're like, oh, maybe I've never done this before, right? There you go. Confronting a fear, right? And, yeah. and confronting fears just gives you more bravery and courage, I think, to do other things. So I want to thank you again for coming. Thank you guys, everybody, for listening. You. And we'll see you again soon. And have a great day. You too. Thanks again, Artur, for talking today about not just skateboarding and learning and teaching, but also things like confidence and muscle memory and training and how we can generalize skateboarding to not only talk about language, but also learning and teaching and connecting with other people. See you in the next episode. If you found this episode helpful in any way, please subscribe and leave a review. It's actually really helpful to me. Now, before I go, I have two tasks for you to do. First, I want you to register and come to my free monthly masterclass. They're on the last Thursday of the month. In just one hour, you're going to master a specific American accent skill. For example, the TH sound or rhythm. The Zoom registration link actually changes each month. So the second and maybe more important thing I want to ask you to do is to sign up for my mailing list because you're going to get the registration link each month and you're going to get bonus materials before and after the masterclass that I only send to my email list subscribers. The email opt-in link is down in the show notes. Be sure to sign up for my mailing list and come to the monthly masterclass for free. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I want you to know that your voice is your choice. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the show. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.